Real quick backstory on the place that we're at. It used to be called the Robinson District. It was founded in 1867. Found gold here. What's interesting about this place, you have a huge porphyry intrusion here. And of course, on the outskirts of that is gold deposits. And I'm going to talk in great depth about why those deposits are here, how they formed, and what you should be looking for when you're out in the field. Now, there are 12 basic models of deposition for gold. And this is one of them. This is a porphyry or intrusion related deposit. Around the Cretaceous time period, you had quartz monzonite intruding into limestone. It's a huge pluton. As it comes up to the surface, it's slowly cooling. As it does so, it starts to undergo changes. And this is where Bowen's reaction series comes in. It's very important you understand that because that magma chamber, it can do all kinds of things. It can turn into all kinds of things. And it's starting to crystallize. Now this was a quartz monzonite stock, which is of the granite family. It was cooling. As it was cooling, it was fracturing. As it was fracturing, all these minerals from down below in the melt are coming up and starting to fill those voids. Now on the outside of this alteration, you have other alteration zones that are going on at the same time. You're gonna have scarn, you're gonna have clay, you're gonna have clay with pyrite. On the outside of that, you're gonna have quartz sericite alteration. Then on the outside of that, you're gonna have argillic alteration. So you're gonna have all these bands of alteration going on around this guy. And this is important for you to know. As it comes in contact with the limestone, as you know on these intrusion related deposits, you're going to have scarn deposits there. Now scarn is a general term and you're going to hear that a lot. A lot of your porphyry deposits are going to have scarn deposits associated with them. Now you have all kinds of scarns out there. You've got iron scarns, copper scarns, gold scarns. There's all different types. You usually find them a lot when you're dealing with some type of intrusion related deposit. But you can also find them in faults and shear zones and geothermal systems too. They're not just isolated to intrusions from igneous rocks. All right, I know this is getting complicated, but just stay with me on this. Now, the reason why you get scarns is a process called metasomatism. All it means is, is that you have a transfer of hydrothermal fluids from the protolith to the wall rock. So you're gonna see a lot of that in your USGS report. When you see scarn, you're gonna think of the metasomatic process. Even though it's a copper porphyry deposit, there can be gold in this scarn. And they have what's called a reduced gold scarn, and those are mined solely for their gold content. Now, mostly your copper porphyry deposits, the gold is a byproduct. And your copper and gold scarns are going to have a high garnet and pyrazine ratio to them. Not to mention a lot of iron. And they're real easy to spot, too. So when you find them, you're going to want to sample them. Most of your USGS reports is going to call it a polymetallic replacement deposit. That's its technical name. Of course, a secondary enrichment scarn. And that's what you're looking for. Because it can be very rich in some sections, depending on where it is, how it formed, and of course, the mineral assemblages that were associated with with its formation. Don't let all those big words fool you. It's the red scar. You see that Gaussian? That's a Gaussian. It's a big old dike sticking up out of here and it's oxidized sulfides. When you find these things, you're gonna dig down around the bottom here and you're gonna pan this out, screen it and pan it and check for little tiny, like 100 minus mesh gold in there that's leached out of this thing. If there is, then you need to start going down underneath it to get to the better gold because most of it's leached out of this thing for millions of years. And that's what a lot of old timers did. They saw these dikes protruding up out of here, these Gaussens, and they'd get up underneath them and that's where all the rich gold was. And you're gonna find these on the outer edges of these giant porphyry deposits of copper. Look at that, holes all over the place. Come on down the river, boy. Good time of the year to be sampling this area. There's some andesite right there, you see that? plain old andesite. Oh, this is called propolite. This is what happens when you hydrothermally alter andesite. See that? You can still see a little bit of andesite right there. That's andesite. But it's been altered. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that. Oh yeah. And this is why the mine dumps at Virginia City look like. They're all this color. You can see that the bedrock is andesite. See that? Oh yeah. Look at that. Isn't that pretty like? See all that rusty red looking material. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's real good. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that real pretty? Oh, yeah. See that? I tell you, check road cuts. You see that? Why am I getting excited about that? Well, look at it. I got some black manganese in there, some really red, rusty gravels running through there. Oh, that's so nice. This is an important area. Why? Because in 1859, Peter O'Reilly and Patrick McLaughlin came up through here. They were sampling. They were coming up here and they were finding little pieces of gold. So they figured they'd follow it all the way up. 
Yeah. Now, why am I getting excited? Because the gold they were finding, son, was in this really black, crumbly rock. It was all laced with gold. It looked real similar to that right there. Ooh, that's so tasty. Of course, I'm gonna have to sample that because I know there's gold in it. So they go wandering up the canyon here and they noticed the gold was getting bigger and bigger as they went up close to the top. Of course, when they got to the top, the gold got real rich. They followed the gold all the way to this. This was the source. This is the Ofer pit. And what they did is they started digging and digging. They were up here working their claims and somebody came up on them. And guess who that somebody was, son? It was Henry P. Comstock. He come wandering up here and he said, boys, I think you're on my claim. Y'all need to skedaddle. And they said, son, you're out of your mind. This is our gold claim. We've been up here for weeks working it. And he said, well, I don't think so. I got papers to prove it. Of course, he didn't have any papers to prove it. He was just fooling them. So what'd they do? They came to a determination that it was easier for three men to work it than to sit there and argue and fight over it. So they all decided to join forces and start working this area right here, the Ofer Pit. What a lot of people won't tell you is what was Henry P. Comstock doing up here in the first place? And why did he think this area was his? Now the backstory is real simple. Henry P. Comstock was taking care of a cabin for two guys, Evan and Hosea Grosh. Now the Grosh brothers were up here earlier and they were up here looking around and they found a whole bunch of gold. They were the original finders of the Ofer Pit, but they didn't have time to file claim because they died, son, that's why. So legend has it is that when Henry P. Comstock was clearing out the cabin, he found a box and inside the box was a whole bunch of maps and the claim papers and some of this beautiful ore. <laughs> so what did he do? He followed the story up to here. That's what he was doing here. That's why he said he had legal claim here, but he didn't. He didn't even have the paperwork filed under his name. <laughs> now what happened? They were finding tons of gold out here. It was all electrum. Remember what I told you about this deposit? Four and a half miles long and about 1,600 feet deep of deposit. Now this deposit is unusual, but it falls under the category of a bonanza type epithermal, low sulfidation. And that's the perfect type of deposit you want. The deposits here, they were all scattered about in the earth, like plums in a plum cake or raisins in raisin bread. So the hard part is, son, these huge bonanzas of masses of electrum were in these irregular pipe chutes, tabular bodies, scattered all throughout here. So it was real hard to figure out where they were. So they sunk shafts everywhere. Some of them hit them, some of them didn't. And that made people real mad because one shaft could hit like the CNC, hit a bonanza. And then right over right next to it, the ward shaft, they didn't hit nothing. 2,500 feet, zip, and nothing. What was the final story? You can only dig so far by yourself, son, before it becomes too labor intensive, too costly. So eventually the three guys sold their claims. Of course, Henry P. Comstock sold his for the least amount of money, and he gambled that away in no time, but he kept running around town saying, it's my load, it's my claim, it's Comstock load. So there you have it. And like I said, it all started here. We're on the north end of the load, and it goes for four and a half miles that way, right into Gold Hill. See this? This tells you that it was boiling. And that's what happens when you have epithermal deposits. You have a lot of boiling going on, and that's where all your mineralization is going to drop out. So you're gonna look for this type of pattern on your quartz. You're gonna have quartz agilera. You're gonna have this bladed quartz like this. Look at that bug right there. Oh, that's pretty too. Now, when you see these types of signs and rocks, you know that the mineralization is really close. When you have boiling and epithermals, that's when it drops out all your mineralization, mostly your gold and silver. That's where you get your electrum from. You know me, I'm always gonna find a way in. That leads right on in. Seen any of these the whole way down. Oh, yeah, you can see all the pipe fittings. It's a good looking line. Look at how they cut this clean. This is nice. Oh, yeah, you can see where it's. Ooh, look at all the bugs down here. Tasty mockers. I like that. I stepped on. <laughs> <laughs> And look at this, I got this beautiful, it looks like a bug, don't it? See the copper staining and all the oxides along the contact zone. And look at their solidification here. Oh, that's, uh, that's real. Look at these original pick marks, see that? From the late 1800s, all through this. This is all been hydrothermally altered. I got an old time shovel, look at that. 
That thing's seen a lot of use. See this? You can see right there, there's the hanging wall and there's the altered, fractured country rock right there. And this right here is what they were going after. I'm gonna have to sample that. And this is a gold mine. And what did I tell you? I told you to look for reds and blacks like that. And this is all looking good. All right, so what do I got here? Well, this is an ore pass. This goes up to the next level. You can see that. I don't know if you can see that. And then at the top, this is where they were working. They dump it down here, cart it down to that chute, and then cart it off to the main shaft. Now, I want you to look right where my light's shining. See that? That's a Prince Albert can, fully intact. And you can see all the blast holes in here, too. Down there at Gold Canyon, there's still gold down there. Oh, yeah! It all came from up here, Gold Hill. Now keep in mind, son, if you plan on going out there looking for that shiny, you better know what's claimed and what's not, because there's a lot of people out here that won't be too happy. Now for those of you out there that are new to my channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click on that little bell, that way you'll get notifications when I make more videos. See those sulfides right there, you see that? Some of that ground up gold in there. Oh, that's looking nice. That's looking real nice.